sister of no mercy. Between the lines, not so young, when you taught fear and cowering, I learned tough and unbelieving. Whatever Leonard says, I say he's wrong and hasn't felt your rod to save this child from spoil. Sweet smile encased in white belies the truth of brown beer bottles in secret cupboards waiting for the time when all as girls are sleeping dorms liberate you to more sins. Um, yeah. So there we go. So, so um, to compare with that one, and Rosalia, 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 I keep saying it wrong, Rosalia will like this one because when I was 13, they shunted me to a military boarding school or in other words, children of military parents. So I was there for two years and that isn't the one. <laughs> Here we go. It's called Books at Boarding School, page 27. They had us read To Kill a Mockingbird by day and yet by night beneath the bedspreads in the sharp defining yellow beams of flashlights, we read Lady Chatterley. <laughs> Understanding simple truths for those who borrowed and followed in the reading circle, playing games with forbidden words, flushing with the thrill, or so we thought. Which do we remember most? Required reading or the secret turning of leaves at midnight, falling asleep, dreaming of worldly adult acts between those orange covers. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go so so those are two that that really sort of hark back to my school days in a way um there's been a lot of history in between and um a few years ago now i discovered that my father wasn't my father i discovered that my father was canadian and that he had um died in the early it was in the royal canadian air force he was in bomber command and he died in the sixth Berlin raid. He's buried in Berlin. Um, but in doing a lot of research and to write the very first book that I wrote, which is still a draft, um, I wanted to find out more about him and, and that side of my family. We discovered that um, his, his ancestors were from the Outer Hebrides. Um, and so with my daughter in 2006, we went on this trip to North Uis in the Outer Hebrides. This is called Postcard from the Western Isles. We've reached this land that once was theirs to kneel, to touch our forebears earth, taste salt of sea thrown island air. We feel this land that was once, that once was theirs before cruel lairds declared them clear from crofts, your lives, your place of birth. We found this land that once was theirs. We've knelt and kissed our forebears earth. But if, if you know about the Scottish clearances, you'll know that a lot of them were put on ships and shunted across mm -hmm. the Atlantic to make a new life. Mm -hmm. It's all about money. So, so here's another poem that I wrote from the other side of the Atlantic called Postcard for Ma from Cape Breton. Ma, walking in the footsteps of our kin, we la who landed on these shores in 1810, crofters cleared out from their highland homes, leaving all behind they've ever known to start their lives again. Ma, see the map, the place marked with a pin, that's Iona, the place that guards within those crofters names and from whence they came to start their lives again. Ma, this became New Scotland to those men and women who, by brad or lakes or, or in harsh fields, skirled their pipes and kept their songs, swirled their kilts and worked to right the wrongs discharged upon them back in 1810 to start their lives again. Mm. So there you go. Thanks. Four little poems out of 160. If you want the rest, you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, if you want any more, if you want any more, give me a number and I'll I'll turn up. Do you want one to make you laugh? Sure. Yeah. I want one to make you laugh. Oh, that's going to be a challenge. I want to make you laugh. <laughs> 
No, I can't, I, you know, I've gone blank. I've gone blank. There are some to make you laugh. Can you think of one, Summer? <laughs> Can you think of one that makes... i tell you what, there is one that, that really is quite pertinent. Um, when the pandemic started in here in about March last year, um, in April, 19th, 20th of April, there was a terrible shooting where, where innocent people were gunned down. Um, and I started to write this poem and I could never finish it. It was called In That Moment, The Unfinished Poem. In that moment, when you meander the trail, stop to listen to the evening peepers, gasp at the sunset, is the moment when all life is taken from you. In that moment, when you stand at your kitchen stove, frying eggs for supper, maybe a little crispy Canadian bacon, you breathe in the aromas of comfort, is the moment when all life is taken from you. In that moment, when you lift your fiddle in your teen basement and thump out a Nova Scotia jig, tapping your feet with love, is the moment when all life is taken from you. In that moment, when you sit on your stoop, and scratch your loyal dog's floppy ears and plan your next virtual class with your students, sip a glass of rosé wine, breathe deeply, is the moment when all life is taken from you. Can't remember how many people died. 19th and 20th of April, 2020. It was horrific to happen here in a small community and I felt I just had to write something, but I couldn't finish it. So there we go. There we go. I tell you what, I'll give you this one just for a giggle. And I hope, I hope, I hope. Page 18. Page 18. Am I allowed to do this one, Summer? What? Well, we're on. Yes, we're on. A man after midnight. She wants to write a song tonight of men or money or mothers or kisses of fire. That's the name of the game. The winner takes it all tonight. Is it Fernando or Waterloo? What a super trooper to take a chance on me. She writes, I have a dream tonight, but does your mother know about Chiquita and the man in the middle? So now it's voulez-vous tonight, as the midnight special says, thanks for the music, but gimme, 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 a man after midnight. <laughs> Other songs, huh? <laughs> There you go. There you go. That's it from me. Don't, you don't. I mean, you know, we've got so much that we can do. But Margaret, over to you. Okay. Um, the book is in um, two parts. The first part is called "So Many Sang to Her," um, and I'll go ahead and um, start start with a few poems from that section. This first one I'm going to read is called Driving to the Jersey Shore. Mm. Friday nights when the factory whistle blew, you'd pop some Springsteen into your tape deck and we'd head out on the interstate from Fairfield to Pinebrook, West Caldwell to East Orange and onto the Garden State Parkway. That's when you'd floor it for the Jersey Shore and the glorious names would accelerate. Cheesequake, Red Bank, Asbury Park, Seeger, Manasquan, Neptune City. Barnegat, Brigantine, Margate. Once we pulled off early at Long Beach Island to watch the sun climb over the ocean. It started off a smidge of lava and exploded into a fireball, burning as hot as Bruce's Badlands. We never made it to Avalon, Wildwood, Cape May, but I loved the sounds of those Jersey towns almost as much as the sea salt air, the warm night wind, the darkness edging the dashboard lights. Yes, I know you had a lifeguard you longed to see in Atlantic City, but I had you inside that car for those three hours, that whole sweet summer. Mm -hmm. So that was about a time before I came out when uh, I didn't seem to know where the lesbians were. <laughs> and then I finally found them after college. And so this is a short poem called First Gay Bar. I can picture that black carousel door even now, nearly 40 years later, my hand hesitating as I reached for the silver handle, a friend nudging my back, my tennis shoe crossing the threshold. 
Was I Columbus setting foot in the new world or Eve reaching for the forbidden fruit? Was this sin or salvation or both? My heart and history were fighting it out. But Donna Summer was calling from inside and I needed some hot stuff that summer. As my new friends clapped and cheered, I followed her onto the dance floor. Um, in my early 30s, uh, I met a woman who was an artist uh, and we were together off and on, operative words being off and on for 10 years. Um, and the next, uh, next three poems I'm gonna read uh, were inspired by that person. <clears throat> this one's called uh, Paddling the Wilderness. And uh, Sue, this is a nod to Canada. It starts off with a Canadian setting. Paddling the Wilderness. We found Tom Thompson in a Toronto museum. His paintings of Canada's landscapes as colorful as a caravan of parade. A waiter told us about Algonquin and those two girls on the dock with dirty bandanas from a week's worth of wild made us long for our own adventure. The next summer we paddled Canoe Lake to Little Joe, to Burnt Island and stopped to camp when black flies made meals of our necks. Mm -hmm. At night, the moon drew a path to us and loons cried out across the water. We made tea and double boiler chocolate that we scooped with graham crackers. We wanted to mate for life, but like Michigan winters, your moods turned gray and I grew stormy. In Chicago, you locked me out of our hotel room. In Kalamazoo, I threw a telephone at the floor. Yet our love kept calling across the waves diving and surfacing year after year. Gone. Now this, this poem has a, an epigraph. It's a Trisha Yearwood song and I'm gonna spare you all. I'm not gonna sing it. Martha knows, you know, <laughs> don't sing. I'll just read it to you. <laughs> she's in love with the boy and even if they have to run away, she's gonna marry that boy someday. I change the word to girl and sing you that country song. You at the kitchen sink, me heading out for work. You wipe soap on your apron, hold my face in your hands to say goodbye. But when I get home, no smells come floating from the oven, no music from the stereo. It takes a moment to notice the half empty coat rack, a moment longer to take it in. Then I see your green goose gone above the kitchen door, one apron on the hallway hook, one bookshelf in the living room. I find your note on the dining room table, then crawl upstairs to bed. Across the hall where you hung your paintings, the walls are a picked sunburn, patchy and raw. The scratches on the wooden floor, the only sign of your tall oak dresser. Mm -hmm. Shooting Angels, Menden, Michigan. Sunday afternoon and I found the old stone church. Across the road, centuries of granite and limestone, name upon name, eroded by time and rain. She used to shoot angels here, her Menden series. Today I shoot angels and headstones and Jesus, then drive to the old brick schoolhouse where ivy claws and climbs the mortar she restored with a lover's care. She thought a one room home and small town life would make her muse return. Instead, they made her long for Kalamazoo where she found me, substitute muse, dependable shelter, immovable star. On Sundays, we would drive down Silver Street to roam the graves and sit outside the schoolhouse in her car. She needed to know her abandoned treasure was still well tended. On those days, we'd walk the St. Joe River, watch birds fly off towards Centerville. She'd point to David and Sarah's house. She loved their studio, their gardens, their marriage, the idea of it all. Nesting was her specialty, her safety net, her terror. She flew back from California once. We sat in a car outside my house. The next poem I'm gonna read um, makes reference to Donald Trump, believe it or not. <laughs> um, 
And this was in the days when he was just an obnoxious rich guy with a reality TV show. <laughs> Back when I wrote this, it's called Floating Through Hades on a Pin Cushion, which turned out to be a lot of what the four years felt like. <laughs> <laughs> Floating Through Hades on a Pin Cushion. The cottage at Green Pond has turned into gingerbread. It's crawling with ants. Donald Trump has taken an interest in the last pink motel in Palm Beach. The woman I loved is laughing in the windows of every party I walk past. A slug falls from my nightgown. A silvery line runs down my thigh. Black flies are migrating to Michigan in V formations. Something's shaking under the house. The plaster's cracking. My teeth are loose. An arm grows from my chest. It flops like a, fl a fish at the light switch. So, a little happier one <laughs> I'll read next. Um, this is from the second part of my book, which is called uh, Singing Back to Her, which uh, basically the, the second half of the book is kind of the story of, of one relationship that was extremely important in my life. And um, that section starts with this poem. <clears throat> The alchemists had nothing on you. Was it your freckled skin that did me in or the smell of cloves upon your neck? Was it that smile that took up half your face or the cheekbones that rose and curved beside your perfect nose? Maybe it was your narrow shoulders or gently jutting collarbones, your lively brows or that space beneath your throat. Maybe it was the way you held my packages so I could find my keys or how you pressed your palm beneath my belt and said, there, that's the place I wanna be. Maybe it was all those things that did their alchemy on me. I followed your ambulance to that hellhole in Pertwee, even emptied your bedpan there. Oh God, I would have followed your ass anywhere. <laughs> Hang on. I gotta switch my little notes here to figure out which one I want to read next. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> here's one from Paris. Novices at Sacré-Cœur. Basilica of the Sacred Heart, built by war's exhausted ones, is penance for sin, place of unending prayers for peace, call to us with its gleaming domes, white as wedding doves or newly laundered sheets. Novices at conflict, intent on romance. We walk the aisles through incense and dust motes as a choir's voices rose to the roof's mosaic, wrapping us in a wreath of song, cocoon of harmony. It was such delicate shelter, such deceptive joy, but how could we have known it that sunny Paris day? Above us, Jesus stretched his tiled arms in blessing, his golden heart aglow. Um, see, wedding Cathedral. Something about the light beneath those trees transformed Dave's lawn to a green cathedral. The first time I entered, alone, the world grew still and dust motes floated in the sun. Today the tents are up and music's moving on the air. A hundred chairs await their guests. You're putting on your wedding dress, bouquet in pinks and blues and yellows. When I see a flower in your hair, I hear that San Francisco song I used to play when I was young and dreamed of kissing girls with flowers in their hair. My cousin starts the processional song. Your sister turns and smiles at us. You lift your shoulders in a happy shrug. I can feel the trees exhaling. Uh, the, the next poem I want to read is uh, set in Kalamazoo. As I mentioned, some of you might have heard in the earlier conversation, I worked at the Kalamazoo Gazette. Uh, I was a, an editor and reporter and worked there for 22 years. And uh, when <clears throat> layoffs came, uh, they came from me in 2010. And then the following year, the staff shrunk even farther. And um, I wrote this poem. Uh, 
it might seem like a bit of an aside, but then looking back at it, it seemed like it kind of in some way foreshadowed the end of my relationship. So I included it in the book. It's called Dateline Kalamazoo, December, 2011. For 86 years, the Gazette stood granite solid at Burdekin level. Now it's moving to a storefront on the mall. 70 journalists are down to nine, though some may be rehired by a renamed, revamped company that gives out news for free. A new press pumped out its first edi edition just eight years ago. Rollers whirring, paper spinning, folders folding, clips grabbing each section, winders whipping pages onto giant spools that would later unwind them into news and sports before they flew out the door to pick up fans and beat up old cars. We were an army then, carriers, accountants, sales crew, artists, designers, editors, reporters, the lady on the phone with a real live voice. We called the new section today with no clue about tomorrow even through a party with tours and punch and praises for the pretty clock tower high above the press. One day we surrounded our three-story beast by the hundreds, climbing its metal stairs like kids up a slide, lining its skinny catwalks, jostling for spots amid paper and ink. We were newspaper of the year. The photo looked like a celebration, but layoffs lurked in the corner. Consolidation with Grand Rapids had already begun. Accounting first, then ad creation, classifieds, copy editing, editing, printing. The paper rolls off another press now at midnight, 60 miles away. The promise of a high speed German machine never to be realized in this city of the promise. Its hulking silhouette lies still behind glass, the decommissioned soldier. That's my uh, ode to beautiful days of the height of our newspaper when uh, it was a really great place to work.